Hi, I'm Laura Blyle from the University of Illinois Research Park, and I'm here today with one of our tenants at the Enterprise Works Tech Incubator, Dioxide Materials. Today, joining me are Rich Mazel, founder and CEO of Dioxide Materials, along with research scientist Wei Zhu and graduate researcher Brian Rosen. Thanks for joining us today at Innovate at Illinois. Welcome. First, tell us briefly about your company and the product it makes and, and the market that those products serve. Okay. Uh, we're trying to do something uh, serious about global warming. According to the people who uh, do research in global warming, to really uh, avoid global warming, we have to eliminate about 80 percent of the, of the CO2 emissions uh, from the world. Um, there's lots of things that people are trying. N nothing gets above, all of it together doesn't get above 30 percent of the total uh, CO2 reductions. So there's a real need to find new ways to do something that will make a substantial difference in the amount of CO2 we dump into the atmosphere so that we can avoid some of the problems that, uh, that people suppose will happen with, if global warming happens. Now we're developing products to make a real dent in global warming. Uh, you have a car, you burn gasoline in your car, it produces carbon dioxide in your tailpipe, CO2 builds up in the atmosphere and that's one of the larger, uh, that kind of thing is one of the larger causes of global warming from the U.S. Uh, we're trying to find a way to not dump the CO2 in the atmosphere, that is take the CO2, collect it again and turn it back to gasoline so we don't build up CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, similarly, if you're at, at home, you know, you have heat and air conditioning and lights and all those things. Uh, the, you, you know, when you burn the natural gas, that creates, that creates carbon dioxide, which contributes to global warming. Um, uh, the utility burns natural gas or coal to make the electricity for your goal, uh, and that contributes to global warming. Um, and so that's another very large part of the global warming, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, global warming from people in the U.S. And so we're trying to find ways to use less electricity and natural gas so that utility doesn't have to burn as much coal, and then you don't have, the, the U.S. Will, will have a smaller contribution to global warming. And of course, save you money if, I mean, if, we, make the, if, we, make, if we make the heating system less, more efficient. You also, uh, energystar.gov says you might be able to save 20 percent, 10 or 20 percent on your heating bill. So I'm working on methods um, that can take carbon dioxide and recycle it into gasoline. Now people have been working on this for the last 15, 20 years, but the problem is carbon dioxide recycling is a very high energy process. And what I'm doing is I'm working on methods in order to use low energy processes in order to take the carbon dioxide and make gasoline from that. What I'm working with is a new catalytic material called an ionic liquid. And an ionic liquid is a catalyst. Uh, catalysts are materials that are used to make chemical reactions go faster than they would otherwise. An example of which is the catalytic converter in your car that will take carbon monoxide and it will convert it to carbon dioxide before it gets emitted from the tailpipe. So what I'm doing is I'm using this catalytic material and I am uh, using it to convert carbon dioxide to gasoline in conjunction with metals or metallic catalytic materials that are used in other processes on very large scales today. We're also using the same basic technology to, uh, to lower uh, uh, people's heating, sp heating bills. Uh, according to the Department of Energy, 75 percent of the uh, electricity in the country and 55 percent of the natural gas uh, goes to buildings. That is, you know, when you provide you, to, you know, when you run your heat and lights and all the commercial buildings, it's 75 percent of electricity in the country and 40 and 55 percent of the natural gas. We have to generate that electricity. If a utility makes a lot of CO2, uh, when you burn natural gas to heat your house, you generate CO2. And so, what we're trying to do is is to is to figure out a way to reduce the amount of CO2 that you would be producing. And to do that, what we have to do is make your heating system work more efficiently. And what's great about that is not only are you doing something good for global warming, but you're also saving money. I mean, who wouldn't want to have a 30, 20 or 30% reduction in their utility bill? 
So my project is to develop a device which you can attach to your thermostat and that will automatically turn down your heating and air conditioning system when you are not at home. And they can also adjust the air, amount of air which is circulated into the system and uh, according to the amount, uh, the number of people who are in the house. So for example, if there are so many people in the house, the heater will provide more air that is needed. And if you are alone in the house, the heater will provide less air. So automatically, you will save a lot of money uh, from, uh, from your heating bills. And the utility will not need to provide uh, as much electricity as before, which means you will, save, you will not produce as much uh, greenhouse gases as before. Your company's advances have been featured not only in scientific journals, the, the journal Science, but also in mainstream press, such as on BBC Radio and Scientific, and Scientific American magazine. So why do you think there is this interest from the general public about what you're doing? So people are interested in what we're doing because this marks the first major advance towards a permanent solution for the excess CO2 that our country generates. The Department of Energy has a term called uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, which is a term that basically means that they're going to bury the carbon dioxide and this postpones the problem. It leaves the problem for a later generation where the carbon dioxide might actually leak out from under the ground. There's actually been reports of carbon dioxide leaks when sequestration has been used, and it's ended up killing a lot of people and it really comes down to, do we want to implement this solution in the community that you live in? Do you want this to be done near your house? So with carbon dioxide recycling, we can take what would normally be a buried uh, product or something that you would emit into the atmosphere, and we're actually recycling it so that it can be used. And the only inputs would be solar power, wind power, and water. And CO2. Another reason that people are so excited about this is, is because uh, uh, the number of jobs that this could possibly create. If we're looking at the U.S., the U.S. now last year spent about $400 billion or, per year to, impo uh, to import oil. Um, our paper suggested it may be possible to uh, build a new industry with lots of jobs to actually create the oil domestically. And you know, $400 billion is a lot of money. It's like Obama's stimulus every single year from now on. And that can be creating a lot of jobs, and it would be jobs in the United States, and people are pretty interested in that. And don't forget lowering people's utility bills, because this new technology can be used to cut people's heating and air conditioning cost. So how are you commercializing the research advances that you have made? We're working with a Fortune 5, well, actually two Fortune 500, 100 companies. We have uh, one company that's already signed a license, one is uh, not quite signed. Um, uh, if we're talking about something that's, you know, going to be billions of dollars uh, as a small company, you can't do that. So what we're doing is we have these big companies um, that are in the business of, of making things that we might be interested in, and they are signing licenses and giving us royalties and helping to fund their research and uh, the hope is that, not I hope, uh, they have uh, promised that they will commercialize these things once we get all the research finished and you know when we're talking about actually solving global warming America and you know and 400 billion dollars American companies are pretty interested in that. So you see multiple applications from these companies yes. of the technology? Yes. So how has the company been funded up to this point? We've done it all by government grants, and I put in a little money, uh, and also money from these big companies. They, they've given us money. Uh, my previous companies have always used venture capital money, but right now there's so much money to do something about global warming since nobody has really a solution for it. And uh, you know, telling the de telling Department of Energy, hey, you can make everybody's heating bill go better and also fix global warming. It's not just not very hard to get money from the government for that. And um, so we've been using mostly government money at this point to, to, to build the company. And, uh, and obviously the, these, these Fortune 100 companies are putting money into us as well, and that helps move us along.
And are those SBIR awards or what government grants specifically? Um, mostly SBIR awards, but also the, we remember we have private. We've had as much private money as SBIR awards. So, what do you think the future holds for dioxide materials? Well, we have a crystal ball, to be honest with you. That's one of the things, the questions that are hard to know because half of you know half the startups fail. So far, everything's worked for us. I mean, that's uh, I don't know how that happened, but you know, you never complain when everything works. We've raised all the money we needed. Uh, we things are going now. We have uh, potential to build into a pretty big business. You know, if we're starting to uh, make a, you know, uh, the government wants to make 16 billion gallons a year of uh, renewable, uh, 32 billion dollars a year, 16 billion dollars a year for things other than e fuel ethanol. If, if that kind of opportunity takes off, um, you know, we have to build a whole bunch of plants, we have to hire a whole bunch of employees, probably we need to have a, a Fortune 100 company because we're never going to be able to, to do that ourselves. But I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, I'm not going to want to be, you know, and when, when, when this is more than, you know, if this is a 500 people company or a 2,000 people company, I don't want to be the manager of that company. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm really good at uh, um, just discovering things and inventing and finding new applications for things that people are interested in and make people's lives better. And probably what will happen is uh, somebody else will take over the company and I'll start just another company someday. Uh, well, that leads me to my next question. Uh, you're a retired uh, professor from the University of Illinois Department of Chemical Engineering. So what has been the transition for you from faculty member to uh, full-time entrepreneur? It's been hardly anything. Um, uh, when I was a faculty member, I had 20-some graduate students and postdocs, had to raise a couple million dollars a year to keep them all going. Um, you know, the students aren't really employees, but they're sort of employees. You have a, you know, you have a big, it's like having your own little company in the university. Um, it's actually cheaper to do things as a uh, entrepreneur than it is to do it in the university. So how has uh, your presence at the University of Illinois Research Park Incubator and perhaps other resources through the university helped the influence the growth and evolution of dioxide materials? Well, we needed to, to, to do any of these things, we needed to get the preliminary data. And the way we did that is we rented an, a, a lab at Enterprise Works. And you know, if I wanted to take a lab and equip it myself, have, take a building, equip it myself, it cost me fifty to $100,000. And as a startup company, when we were just starting, we just didn't have $100,000. Um, I came in here, I rented an office for a couple, for, you know, I rented a lab for thousand or two dollars a, a month and I was able to get that get access to that hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and lab space and everything else and that was actually very helpful because it let the company go going it let us take the preliminary data that we needed to let all these other things happen um, the other thing that enterprise works has done as well as that I've enjoyed is to create a community of entrepreneurs uh, we're here, there's a lot of other entrepreneurs, the CEOs of a lot of the companies get together, they have, they have entrepreneurs in residence here. Um, these are guys who have done it before. I can sit down and go talk to them, uh, in which I um, do a lot of advice. I'm, I, I'm not, I, I, I know when I'm not good at something and there's a lot of good people to give me advice and talk to and that's been a, uh, the other big thing that I've uh, taken advantage of. Well, thank you very much for being with us today. I've appreciated learning more about dioxide materials and, and about what we can do to help uh, reduce our impact on global warming. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you Wei. Thank you, Rich. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you very much.